Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Good morning. Um, thank you all for coming to the Texas Action for Healthy Kids Summit. I am Lisa Lasasso. I'm the chair of Tex Texas Action for Healthy Kids, but I absolutely 100% must state that there is a team of people who put this together. Michelle Smith, who did an extraordinary job of organizing this, and if the planning committee who is here, if you could just stand for a moment so we can recognize you. Stand, or are they outside planning and doing? <laughs> I think that might be, okay, well anyway, let's just give them some love. Yes. Um, I'm going to be very brief because we have a jam-packed agenda and we want to stay on time. So that will be sort of our task up here is to make sure that we are on time throughout this whole day. There's a lot of information, some exciting initiatives um, that you all will be learning about and information that may be very new to you. Um, and we certainly encourage everyone to as you're listening to the presenters, jot down questions um, and information that you'd like to learn more about because at the end you'll have the opportunity to visit with the pre presenters yourself uh, to get more information. Um, I did want to let you know with Texas Action for Healthy Kids this year, we have a, a pretty strong focus on building our network and really getting the word out through communications and social media um, to let Texas know what is happening in Texas. And so what I'm going to ask all of you to do that, that is just a simple sort of task is that if your organization or you as an individual or if you're a parent and you are on Facebook, um, if you could please go to the Texas Action for Healthy Kids webpage, I mean Facebook page, you just search for it, and like us and we're going to start really building information um, and and ask you all to contribute what you're doing in your own areas. Um, we've got some serious issues in Texas with a lot of incredible work being done. So this would be a gathering point where we can all be sharing best practices and learn how to contribute and take action. Um, just real quickly, a couple little housekeeping items. The bathrooms are right outside the door. Um, and we will be having a break at around 11, um, sponsored by Dairy Max, who I work for. And I'll give you a little blurb about that at 11. Um, and I think that's it. So we're going to introduce uh, the whole summit with a little video about Texas Action for Healthy Kids. Scott? Yes. 
brought together staff, parents, community members, and redid a, a cafeteria at Lamar Middle School in Austin. It was so exciting to put a little fabric and some paint together with some ideas and make the cafeteria a healthy environment that kids could enjoy their lunches. The original plan was to uh, bring color and uh, art that promotes healthy choices in eating. We enjoy what we're eating more uh, by what we're looking at while we're eating. So the beautification project turned out really well. We have a lot of color in our cafeteria. And uh, everyone feels really good about, about uh, how nice the cafeteria is. And the kids show it through how much they enjoy eating. Okay, and with that, I would actually like to introduce, with great pleasure, our keynote speaker and first presenter, um, Gracie Kavnar. She is a journalist, writer, founder, president, and CEO of Recipe for Success Foundation. Um, inside your folders, just to let you all know, there's a bio on each of our presenters, but just a highlight about Gracie. She created Recipe for Success Foundation in 2005 to combat childhood obesity by changing the way children understand, appreciate, and eat their food. Uh, she, in just five years, she has worked with over 16,000 children. It is the largest initiative of its kind in the country and has attracted attention from many activists, the White House, and national press. Pretty impressive. Gracie, welcome. Great. Well, everyone knows I, I have a passion. Um, I'll, bet, I'll bet you have a passion too. Is it, is it your passion that brought you here today? Because it's my passion that gets me up every day. My passion is real food. You know, for my own consumption, that's come to mean locally grown, pesticide-free, just picked fruits and vegetables grown by someone I know, usually me. But for my neighbors, I'm constantly thinking of shortening the path between field and plate and encouraging everyone to develop an understanding and a respect for the essence of real food. My passion for good food has picked up sisters and cousins along the way. Organics, food justice, truth in advertising, family farms, shared meals, urban agriculture, farmers markets, and children's nutrition. Real food has a big family, and I love them all. I have to admit that this passion kind of snuck up on me. One day I was begging for Tang and, um, you know, drink of astronauts. <laughs> the next thing you know, I'm asking the farmer just how far away was this arugula grown. Passion like that is often unplanned, an epiphany sparked by an everyday sort of an experience. But harnessed, it can change the world. And that's what I'm trying to do, one bite at a time. I'm old. I grew up in the 1950s. Back then, if something was worth eating, you could fit it between two slices of Wonder Bread. My mother was raised in the country, but boy, she left Green Acres behind for the big city of San Antonio. She fancied herself avant-garde. I mean, you know, we had the white leather sofas and the aluminum Christmas tree. She was enamored with convenience foods. Canned and powdered meant sophisticated. You know, fast food, we don't think about this, but fast food was on the very tip of the women's lib spear, along with washing machines, and every other modern convenience that gave a woman one ounce of her time back and freed her from spending all day in the kitchen. 
Now we know there have been unintended consequences. Even though my own mom admitted that processed food couldn't hold a candle to the fresh fruits and vegetables that she grew up eating on the farm, it didn't matter. We ate canned green beans and fruit cocktail and frozen frisk sticks. Salad, it was a wedge of iceberg. We were modern. It was my dad, the Luddite, who finally insisted on a garden. I think I was about nine years old when he gave me my first nip of just harvested food. It was sweet corn on the cob. Well, I was hooked. I couldn't get enough. I took over the responsibility of family dinners at nine just so I could cook. Now, another thing is it's also so I didn't have to clean up because we're a family of girls. If you cooked, you didn't have to clean. I hate to clean up. But Pandora was out of the box. I wanted more. First, Julia Child captured my imagination. I read Mastering the Art of French Cooking like a novel. I never missed her show on PBS. I eventually went to cooking school myself in Paris and became a sometime caterer and full-time enthusiastic thrower of dinner parties. I mean, this wasn't my profession. It was my passion. It was a, it was a hobby. Uh, you know, I wasn't totally hooked. After all, I, you know, I'm from Texas. I still serve ranch-style beans, and we all know that queso is made with Velveeta. <laughs> <clears throat> Even though we don't know exactly what Velveeta is, right? <laughs> and we all love a Whataburger. Um, I never lectured anybody about food. It was just, you know those Thanksgiving green beans, the ones that are like layered in the mushroom soup with the little fake French cheese fry things on top. I didn't even complain about those. Fabulous fresh food to me was a celebration of life. A hobby, like macrame. Well, that just shows my age. Nobody macrames anymore. But it wasn't a political position. It was all about the taste. But life changed when I had my son. Food was in the news. I happened to be living in California at the time. Meat boycott chemicals. Everybody was talking about aspartame and the fact that it was in baby food. And then the shocking reports that those, those simple little jars of baby food that look so enticing and so cute with the Gerber's baby on the label, 90% um, sugar. I read Sugar Blues. I was, I was stopped in my track. It was the early 70s. And I discovered that the world of chemistry had taken over that simply canned food of my childhood. You know, that shrimp cocktail and green beans. And it could no longer be assumed innocuous. We all know what mamas do. We are very protective, right? So it was the protective maternal instincts that drove my decision to abandon commercial baby food and we're talking nearly 40 years ago, so it wasn't really the trendy thing to do. I made a rule. Every single processed food was declared off limits in my kitchen. We didn't even have Velveeta anymore. <laughs> Cooking from scratch was the way we rolled 24-7. Whatever I made for dinner, no matter how spicy or exotic, went into the blender and was fed to the baby. I didn't need a cookbook for that. You see him a lot now. There wasn't a thing that he wouldn't eat at three. He was, not, you know, he was at sushi and raw oysters. And he started helping himself in the kitchen. He never realized that other kids put sugar on their cereal or that they probably ate tricks instead of oatmeal. His TV time was pretty much limited to Sesame Street. So he didn't demand Happy Meal toys. He didn't even know about them. He was nine before he had his first Coca-Cola, uh, where? Of course, at a sleepover. But by then, it was his first. He didn't like it. It was too sweet. Food rules were easy to maintain because food marketing didn't penetrate my home. You know, I wasn't too concerned with the rest of the world, just my own kids. It was in the mid-90s after they were grown and gone, 
<clears throat> when I discovered just how out of control things had become. Junk food marketing was invading elementary schools, not just in the hallway, vending machines, but on the lunch line. And it was Susan Combs, everybody knows I'm like a wild-eyed Democrat, uh, but Susan Combs and I like locked arms. And um, I did everything I could to help her from the field get vending machines out of Texas elementary schools. I'm so excited that we were one of the first ones to do that. We really owe a great debt of gratitude to Susan because she just, like the Energizer Bunny, like it didn't work this way, okay, we're gonna go this way, okay, we're gonna go this way, and we got it done. But it was during this process that I learned so much. You know, food in schools has always been controversial. By now we know, uh, and we've all heard, that the school lunch program was started in 46, right, because our, our soldier recruits were showing up emaciated and unfit to fight. But anytime money's involved, all of a sudden it gets real serious. And the school lunch program immediately became embroiled in serial struggles among food and drink companies, farmers, agribusiness, school administrators, and nutritionists. They fought over who could regulate what, where, and when. There was so much money at stake. Remember the ketchup and pickle controversy about is ketchup a vegetable? Thank you, President Reagan. That was in the 80s. That was small potatoes compared to the efforts made by the soda industry to break into the lunch line. In 1983, acting on a suit brought by the National Soft Drink Association, I hope, no, are we being sponsored by Coke? I hope not. A panel of judges ruled that the USDA could regulate drinks in public school cafeterias only at mealtimes and in the cafeteria on the lunch line. As long as soft drink and candy companies had the permission of local school boards and administrators, they could sell anything, anytime, anyplace else. What's wrong with an occasional Coke and some chips, you know, if it's paying for the scoreboard? That was pretty much everybody's attitude. Vending machines begin to multiply like bunnies in the hallways and gymnasiums of all of our schools. I mean, we had, a, we had a vending machine in a far off hallway when I was in high school in the 60s. You couldn't get to it during school. You had to know where it was to find it. I think it was probably belonged to the teachers. Um, it's not like we had regular access to it, but now vending machines were in elementary schools. You know, I knew about the cartoons, the toys, the cross marketing that motivated even the tiniest tots to demand sugary and sugary cereal and snacks and chicken nuggets. You know, that was bad enough. But now, in my opinion, this is what got my dander up, even if she limited TV time like I did. A mom could no longer shield her kids from junk food. No matter what the home rule, a five-year-old with 75 cents in his pocket could buy his own Cokes at school or have nothing but chips for lunch. And what a coup for the soft drink industry, right? Snaring what they call that cradle-to-grave customer on the cheap, actually even making money off of it. I was so livid. I, I cannot even, you know, don't piss off a redhead, as my <laughs> husband says. At first, I was focused on protecting young children from junk food. So that's when I was, you know, working with Susan. I simply wanted to give parents control. So while I was doing this groundwork, things like using the Open Records Act to sit down with the principal and say, so how are you using the money from the vending machines and how many trips have you taken to Disney World, you know, with PepsiCo and things to embarrass them? Um, that was my job. <laughs> while I was doing that, I was pulling the string. In journalism, we call it, you know, find the nub of a story, pull the string and find the whole story. And what I found out stopped me in my tracks. Nobody was talking about it. Now, thanks to the efforts of the First Lady to bring the dialogue into the national stage, it's plastered across the 
that's plastered across the media, you know the problem. We are suffering from the explosive effects of a spiraling obesity epidemic, and now obesity has eclipsed smoking as the number one health hazard in America. Between 1980 and 2000, obesity rates doubled, and in the last 10 years, they've almost doubled again. Today, more than one-third of Americans are so overweight that we are at critical risk for obesity, and Texas is one of a dozen states where another third of us are already clinically obese. As a nation, we need to lose 4.6 billion pounds. It's a hell of a diet. But the sad part is 41% of us are on track to be morbidly obese by 2015. That's what the predictions are. That's just four years away, right? And we know that as it happens like a steamroll, it just, it's just exponential increase. And the crisis, of course, has invaded even our children's lives. 20 million American kids today are significantly overweight or already obese. Texas, again, among the highest ranking states, with more than 20% of our low-income preschoolers obese. I'm not talking baby fat. I'm talking clinically obese four-year-olds. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but, you know, unless we get control of this, this generation will be the first, we hear this all the time, to not outlive their parents. I'm thinking die even before their parents die. Remember how school lunch was originally designed so we could have healthy boys as soldiers? And now the U.S. military is warning us that recruits are so overweight that they're unfit to serve and it's become a threat to our national security. It's just not fat weighing us down. The financial burden is heavy, too. Weight-related issues cost this country, these are brand-new numbers, $270 billion last year, four times the amount a decade ago. And I have to say, it's, it's 100 and I think 40 billion more than I was just saying last year from numbers from 2008. That's how fast it's going up. New numbers indicate that obesity accounts for no longer just 9% of medical spending, but 16.5% of all medical spending. Costs are expanding as fast as our waistlines. The saddest thing that I learned back in the 90s is that obesity is a stealth killer. The 20 million kids, the ones who are obese today, have a much higher risk not only of the type 2 diabetes, which seems to dominate um, the news cycle, but hypertension, heart disease, liver disease, kidney failure, cancer. These diseases are striking them now as young as six years old. Six. A six-year-old with hypertension. I, I'm speechless. Catastrophic diseases that kick in this early will keep millions of this generation out of the workforce entirely. And we already know it's going to kill them. There are plenty of contributing factors that exacerbate this problem, but I learned that at the core, the cause is what we eat and how we eat it. We're talking about food. My passion, right? It got my attention. So in the mid-90s, I began to unravel the remarkable changes in our food system during the last 40 years. The industrialization of farming, an explosion of the snack food industry, the ensuing sophistication of manipulation of food, the multi-layering processing of the simplest food items because every time you add a layer, you add money for somebody. The design of a food distribution system that values ease of shipping over all other factors. Farm subsidies, launched 35 years ago to feed a hungry nation, triggered a profusion of cheap corn. Cheap corn syrup ignited an explosion of processed food. 
Now you cannot walk down the grocery store aisle and find anything that doesn't have corn syrup in it. Not anything. Cheap corn feed created a whole new paradigm for livestock that flooded the market with inexpensive, low-quality meats. None of this stuff has the nutrients, none of this food-like substance has the nutrients of what it looks like it should have, right? Cut-rate ingredients drove a profusion of high-profit products for a few powerful manufacturing business and fast food chains. Did you know that today 10,000 new products hit our shelves every single year? 10,000 new products. Today's diet isn't about fresh fruits and vegetables harvested in season, distributed locally, and prepared from scratch at home? No. Most daily American diets consist of high-calorie food made of sugar, fat, and compelling flavors, but few nutrients. And it's all dressed up as convenience or coolness personified and it's marketed 24-7. In fact, one-third of Americans eat fast food every single day. The more I learned, the more I realized this is a war. It's a complex war we're facing, not just one enemy, from the powerful marketing influences of junk food makers to a sharp increase in television watching and processed food consumption, the cultural shifts that devalue home cooking while making professional chefs media stars and multimedia entertainment, and the demise of the family meal, the enemy is all around us. But we're complicit. Food companies know just how to make our mouths water. These new foods are not easy to figure out. They always look just like they always have, right? But they're so dramatically different with added chemicals controlling everything from appearance to taste to smell in recipes that create a neurochemical addiction. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's the fact. Over time, these hyperpalatable foods actually change our brain chemistry in ways that make us overeat. Now we're learning that these added chemicals are not only driving the obesity epidemic, they're contributing to the rise in autism and a wide range of autoimmune diseases. And I think you're going to start seeing more and more of that data coming out. You know, the way I look at it, if a food is approved by the FDA, it only means that it won't kill you immediately. <laughs> to sell all this junk food, powerful media campaigns extol a new culture of eating that celebrates salty snacks, sweet drinks, and calorie-dense, nutritionally deficient fast food. Family meals shared around the dining table are usurped by high-speed living, right? Constant grazing the fast, easy drive through window, over-processed heat and serve entrees, and the, what I think of as the personalized takeout order snared on the run, right? Every, everybody in the family has their favorite fast meal. Mom goes through drive throughs and picks up a bag for everybody on the way home, comes home, puts it in the middle of the table. That's our family meal these days. High processed food is fun, it's fast, it's fashionable, and food marketing is bombarding us with that message every single place we turn. There is no safe haven. Children see a junk food ad every five minutes during Saturday morning cartoons alone. Advertising triggers what psychologists call the brain's click whir response. Food advertising that promotes snacking, fun, happiness, and excitement directly contributes to increased food intake. The tradition of sitting down to three family meals each day has melted into all-day grazing. It's now socially acceptable to eat at any time. Was it that way when you were growing up? Were you grazers? We're grazers now. But most of us don't even realize that there's a problem. It's like, what? What could be bad about convenience and flavor? 
Faced with the deep pocket advertising campaigns of big food, I knew that consumers are like lambs to the slaughter. Well, one of my favorite things to say is, if you think you have free will, even if you know a lot about marketing, you're wrong. I mean, who would have thought that we all needed SUVs in order to be more adventurous? But that's what we all have now, because we didn't want to get old. We wanted to be young and hip and whatever. And that's the power of marketing. So I had an idea. It scares people when I say this. I have an idea. I say it too much, I know. Um, that's the most scary thing. Second only to, um, I can do that. I have this belief that you can do anything that you put your mind to. You know, even brain surgery, all you have to do is train for it, but you could do it, right? It was this combination of words, idea, do, that launched Recipe for Success Foundation. You know, I never planned to spend my retirement in a 60-hour-a-week unpaid job. I was kind of thinking Paris, you know, apartment, go to those markets, do a lot of cooking. But when I discovered this epidemic, and I realized that I was in a really unique position to help, I felt I had to. I had to do everything I could to change the way children eat. Through this journey, I've learned that every powerful action starts with just that, a flicker of inspiration, an idea, grassroots movements that mobilize thousands of teachers, parents, volunteers, funders, dare I say, <laughs> and activists start with exactly that, an idea that's followed with the passion required to transform it into action. Action for healthy kids, that's why I love that name. Do something. The power is in the follow through. So at Recipe for Success Foundation, we are working to change the story of childhood obesity. We want a different ending. So we're translating research into action with hands-on classes that connect with real staying power. We fight marketing with marketing. Our programs put children in touch with their food from seed to plate, and we make it fun. We think kids need to know that their food doesn't grow in those drive through windows, right? Twinkie, guess what? Twinkie is not a vegetable. You know, eating isn't an option. We all make about a thousand eating decisions a year. So, but the way we eat is an option. So I want most of those eating decisions to be good ones. That's my goal. So five years ago, we launched what we call our Seed to Plate Nutrition Education Program in Houston Elementary Schools. We invade the schools. We celebrate food. We garden. We cook. We create a culture of health throughout the campus in every class. It's working. We start literally planting the seed with these kids in huge gardens that we build on school grounds, enough dirt for every teacher to have their own bed filled with veggies, fruits, and herbs. You know, I've seen a lot of school weed beds when I took a look at schools, and I determined that the biggest problem is nobody had individual ownership of that garden. It was like a shared space. So we made an end run around that and said, you know, this is your space to keep up. It's amazing how that works. Um, it's enough dirt for every teacher to have their own bed. And there they work with students and with parents, and we work with them to weave lessons in the garden throughout the rest of their studies in math, science, language, arts. The gardens literally touch everything in school. Then they're at the crossroads, at the very heart, honestly, of what we do. Chefs are helping the kids connect the produce from their garden to the food on their plate. Idea, do. Together, 
We've created a program like no other in the country. We call it Chefs in Schools. It's a part of our seed to plate. Professional chefs teach. You know, actually they mentor young children, empowering them to create healthy meals and snacks for themselves. We now have 80 of Houston's finest chefs who volunteer their time to help. And we were the uh, inspiration for the Let's Move the Chefs Move to School program. We roll our cooking carts right into the classroom and we lead kids through monthly explorations of flavor. We begin with how do taste buds work together and over the course of the year we move through the entire food plate. It used to be the food, we used to climb the pyramid, now we work our way around the plate. With easy to make recipes using produce the kids have picked from their garden. We don't do ants on a log. We don't do happy face pancakes. We make ratatouille and pesto and whole wheat pizza. I mean, they are kids. It has to be fun. But the point is, we don't just teach these children how to follow a written recipe or make fun snacks, but the very essence of how to make healthy, yummy food with dishes that they will eat their entire lives. So the children learn the entire cycle of food. They plant the carrot, they tend the carrot, they harvest the carrot, then they gather with their class to make carrot soup, sit down and share it around a dining table. Along the way, they learn teamwork, sharing, etiquette, a little math, science, creative writing. By making it fun, we instill a lifelong enthusiasm for fresh fruits and vegetables and a respect for real food. My favorite, my favorite story is when, you know, because we have people come in and take a look at classes all the time, and I tell people how we're actually changing kids' perception about fruits and vegetables and encouraging them to eat, and they're like, mm-hmm, yeah, thinking about how hard it is to get their kids to eat broccoli, or, you know, they, everybody has their own preconceptions. I'm like, come look, come see. Uh-huh, I'm gonna come see. And they like to think they're gonna sneak around, talk to the kids, just, one-on-one, -on -one, get the real scoop. So what's your favorite vegetable, they like to ask. And my favorite answer, which is 90% of the time, the kids will say something like, kale chips. <laughs> okay, I get it. You know, when we started, it was me and literally every friend I could strong arm into helping. We are building those cooking carts in my living room. I, you know, I was like helping every class. I was calling my friends to get them to volunteer in the classroom. But many have been moved, been moved by our passion. And today, we have a dedicated team of professionals on staff, chefs, gardeners, teachers, nutritionists, working alongside hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. Now we've taught over 16,000 kids during the school day, after school, during summer camps. That number grows every single day. We're one of the largest programs of our kind in the country, and when I say that, I mean this repetitive programming that builds on itself and, and changes lifestyles. We've gotten a lot of attention. We've won awards. Children are changing their habits and their attitudes. You know, they surprise themselves by, by loving vegetables that they would never touch before. Parents tell us that kids are now cooking at home and, and actually making requests for grocery store purchases. They prefer healthy foods. They're self-selecting salads when, you, when they go to McDonald's still. <laughs> Teachers, of course, are reporting uh, improved behavior in class. Deborah and I were talking about this it's, uh, earlier. We all knew that would happen. I don't maintain that that's one of our purposes in life, but we know a child who eats healthy and well will behave better. Everyone's paying attention to their food and they're making better decisions. Because our strategy and our passion are so powerful, we have thankfully become a national model and an inspiration for a lot of folks. And the White House encouraged us to, um, to go to scale. That boy, that's a scary word, <laughs> go to scale. But you know, we did it because I think you can do anything. So. I had an idea and we did it and everybody's like, yay, we're, we're all about it. So now every child in America will have access to our proven curriculum. 
our new Seed to Plate Nutrition Education Affiliate Program will support partner schools across Texas and the nation by training and certifying instructors and providing dynamic monthly ins instructor support with curriculum and resources for their students. We're keeping the participation costs low by providing these services through the web, available at any time. We've created an e-learning website that's pretty darn exciting, I have to say. Our inaugural affiliate partners include KIPP, YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, three entire school districts. We won't stop until every school in America and every elementary child in America has access to our programs. We want to be the Girl Scouts of nutrition education. I guess you should say Boy Scouts. Girls are Boy Scouts. We want it to be just as cool to eat healthy food as it is to guzzle a soft drink or eat the latest trendy fast food. And I think we can do it. It was a mother's instinct and my passion for food that compelled me to create Recipe for Success and to train the food consumers for tomorrow, to read the label, to make informed decisions, and reclaim the wisdom of their grandmothers, to celebrate their cultural legacy through honest food. It's our responsibility as individuals and as a community to take back the dialogue and reframe the critical issue of good nutrition. We each have the power to drive change in our own way. So I want to ask you, what is your passion? How will you use it to save our kids? We all know there is so much to do. We need to hold food companies accountable for making nutrition information easy to find and understand. We need to make sure all neighborhoods have easy access to fresh, affordable food. We need to support local farmers and the infrastructure they need to stay in business. We need our schools to serve healthier lunches and encourage farm to school programs. We need to bring teachers and administrators on board to work together to create that culture of health to permeate their campus. We must insist we must insist that advertising to children be controlled. Take toys out of fast food meals and junk food out of cartoons and games. We must demand better food for our homes and schools. And we must educate our children from their first bite to pay attention, to ask questions about their food, to be empowered consumers. You know, from the beginning of time, it was food that drove us from our caves to explore the world. Food fueled trade. It pushed people to new realms, to new awareness. You know, food even drove the discovery of America. And now food may be the very thing that's killing us. It doesn't have to be that way. Today will be packed, I know it, I've seen the lineup, with powerful ideas and inspiration for changes you can make in your community, at your school. There is so much to do. Pick something that matches your passion and get after it. Make a difference. You know, six years ago I said, I can do it. I did. You can too. Thanks. Thank you, Grace. That is ex some extraordinary work, some fantastic points that you made along the way. And I think what, what is really profound that I, I find in all of this is that we continually have to qualify when we talk about food as real food 
or junk food, you know? And so really the question of, of the term food, what does that mean and how are we interacting with it? I also think that the work that you're doing with the kids is um, absolutely critical and, um, and really congratulate you on taking your idea, manifesting it and sharing it with us.